he doesn't have the right name. Well, good morning. Uh, a little soggy out there today, but uh, any day uh, with the Lord's a good day, amen? Mm -hmm. And good to have you with us this morning on this bright, sunny, well, uh, somewhere it is, bright and sunny <laughs> right, uh, day. And we have a lot planned for the day. And of course, Monday's the kickoff for a vacation Bible school, so they're going to do the setup right after service today. That'll be a lot of fun. I always remember that the last five years that I've been here each year, everybody's hands get there in that and many hands make light the work. Amen? Yeah. Uh, so we're looking forward to that and then uh, um, saw that if you came in, saw the decorations over here to the side, they've been working little cactuses everywhere, flowers on them I think. And uh, so it'll be an exciting time. Uh, first batch of youth uh, came back from camp and they're going to speak to us today and then after that we have another batch going next week and we'll have prayer over them. And the biggest group goes next week so it's a good time. Uh, exciting to see everything uh, happening that's happening. Uh, although summer is moving so rapidly uh, it's going to be that other kind of word not long from now. I'm not even going to mention it. It starts with a W. <laughs> but I'm not even going to mention it. If you're visiting with us online, we're glad to have you with us today and uh, ask God's blessings to be upon you as we focus on our study. Uh, we have been studying the number seven uh, in uh, the Bible and uh, we did our homework. Uh, we looked at the first mentioned principle, F. MP, first mentioned principle, found that the first time seventh mention in the Bible is Genesis 2. <clears throat> we made a summary statement from what we read there, and it was seven has something to do with completion, being finished, and resting or being done, as we would say. 
And so uh, normally we would go through verse by verse, but we've decided to go through by topics to confirm our summary statement. And we spent an extensive amount of time looking at resurrections. And what we found, uh, even though we haven't investigated it all, is I'm proposing to you that um, every one of these has seven uh, in them. When God does things, he does it by sevens. Seven resurrections, seven mysteries, seven baptisms, seven ages. And this will, when we get to the last, will really be a perfect dovetail into our Wednesday night Bible study as we see it all come together. So we're looking forward to getting there, but uh, the trip along the way is not bad either. So we're enjoying the trip uh, as we go down through these. Uh, we've been talking about the mysteries in the Bible, uh, spoken of... Uh, uh, seven different mysteries in the Bible. We're not taking them in order necessarily. Uh, we are going through them um, just in an accounting of them, but not necessarily in any order. Uh, the first one that we talked about was in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, and that is that Israel will be restored as a nation. And then the second thing that we looked at uh, was found in 1 Timothy 3.16, that great verse, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And so we talked about the incarnation. God was wrapped in human flesh. And then the third one was found in Revelation chapter uh, number 17 and verse number 5. And this had to do with a religious <coughs> institution or a system that is uh, referred to as... Uh, um, a great mystery Babylon, the whore, uh, and it uh, means that they sell themselves, uh, make merchandise of the things that are sincere and real. And then uh, the one that we've uh, uh, kind of uh, set on here for a little while, the fourth mystery was found in Colossians 1.27, and it is the mystery of the indwelling. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get started. But before we do, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we are thankful today for your goodness to us. Uh, so many wonderful things that we get to be a part of today. We thank you for the rain. We certainly needed that. We pray, Father, that you would bless all those whose livelihood depends upon farmers and others. We pray, Father, also that you would focus, uh, allow us to focus uh, in these rainy times when it's uh, easy to fall asleep. They help us to focus on your word this morning in Sunday school as well as in church. Uh, the spirit is uh, willing, the flesh is weak. Uh, I pray, Father, that you help us in that. I pray, Father, also that you be with those that are visiting with us online. They may be uh, live or they may be viewing this at some time after uh, the event actually occurs. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to get understanding of your word and be blessed by the study as well. Thank you for all those that check in with us and our opportunity to connect back with them. I pray, Father, that you bless this service and the service to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we got to this fourth mystery, the indwelling, um, we talked about the indwelling uh, as mentioned in Colossians 1.27, the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And uh, so we looked at that verse. You might just turn there. It would be easy to uh, connect. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 27. And we said in reading that verse, there were some things, uh, some questions that we, we, we'd we like to address. One of them uh, is uh, that first part uh, where it says there, to whom God would make known what is the mis uh, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And we talked about uh, question number one was, why does it say the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles? And we answered that, that the only way for a Gentile to connect with God was through uh, proselyte, uh, being proselyted to Judaism. And uh, now, because of the work of the Holy Spirit and the death of Christ our Savior, uh, they are able to have access to God directly through Jesus Christ. And so it's a, uh, specifically for the, the among the Gentiles. The second question is, what does in you mean? And we spent some time looking at that last week, um, that uh, uh, this personal relationship 
the Jews never had prior to Jesus' death on the cross. The Jews always connected with God on a national level, but never on a personal level. And uh, so Paul wrote, the mystery was Christ in you, and he was revealing something different than had ever been experienced before, a personal relationship with Jesus, God's Son. And this was unique. The Jews really didn't quite understand that. To this day, they still struggle with that uh, because they, uh, they look at Jesus as less than God. They look at him as a prophet like unto Moses, and they, they struggle with the, the acceptance that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Uh, but this is the mystery. And we talked about uh, that even though it's a mystery in the sense that Christ is in you to the Jew, it, it shouldn't be as much of a mystery as it is. Because we talked last week about when Jesus died on the cross, there were several things that occurred. And one of them was the veil in the temple rent from the top to the bottom. So it's not like someone could grab a hold of the bottom somehow or another, Samson, and pull it and rip it apart. But it, it, it ripped apart from the top to the bottom. And so uh, for the first time ever, every priest that, that uh, participated in the services of the tabernacle could look into the Holy of Holies where God dwelt and not die. They knew something had happened that was unique. And so, uh, but this is the mystery, is Christ in you? Uh, but why is it called a mystery? And to answer that question, question, we had to consider the role of the third person of the Godhead, the Spirit of God. And this is where we left off last week. The first appearance of God's Spirit in the, in the Old Testament was in the creating role, Genesis 1-2. We looked at that. Uh, he was also involved in the creation of humankind, according to Job 33 and verse 4. But other than this role, God's Spirit is seen directing, empowering, and imparting wisdom upon individuals. And we looked at a lot of those scriptures last week, just to get, just, not that, that they're the only ones, but just so we could get an idea that, that those are the works of the Holy Spirit, is creation, creation of humankind, uh, directing, empowering, and imparting wisdom upon individuals. In all of these cases, as well as in a countless number of other cases in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God, and this is what's important, um, only came upon them, only came upon them for the work. Uh, notice, if you would, uh, this phrase, come upon, in the first mentioned principle, Genesis chapter 34. Again, one of the great ways to start any study is the first mentioned principle. And so let's look at this phrase, if we can, uh, came upon the first mentioned principle. Look at Genesis 34. Genesis 34. And look at verse 25. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. All right, so this is very important. Look at verse 27. And uh, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. So you know the story of Dana and the uh, Shechem who defiled her, and as a result of that, the uh, uh, sons of Jacob said, here's what we'll do, you know, God won't allow us to interact with other tribes and people unless the males are circumcised, and so they said, okay, we'll do that, and right after they were circumcised and couldn't move around much, uh, Simeon and Levi uh, took sword and killed the whole clan, all right, but notice what it says down there, this first time this phrase is used in the Bible, this verse 27, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain, they didn't stay there, they came upon him, slew him, and left. All right? And so this is the first time that we see they came and left. Now notice this throughout the Old Testament. We'll just examine a few of the many references, but you can see the first mentioned principle then checks out as we look through the Bible. So let's start a little bit of a study here. Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Levit Leviticus, Numbers, chapter 24. Uh, Numbers chapter 24. And look, if you would, with me at verse number 2. Let's 
story of Balaam and Balak. If you remember the story, the nation of Israel is moving through the uh, wilderness, and uh, they uh, they were getting larger and larger and larger, and uh, had fought many different battles and won. And Balaam uh, uh, was a prophet, and Balak, the king of Moab, said, and these people are going to swallow us up. We, we need to get them cursed. So he tried to write uh, Balaam a check to come curse God's people. And uh, as hard as Balaam tried, and as much as he wanted that blank check, <laughs> every time he opened his mouth, nothing but blessings came out. Amen? But here, notice what it says in verse uh, number uh, 2. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. All right, again, just like we saw in the first mentioned principle, the Spirit of God comes upon him and then leaves. Comes upon and then leaves. Look at Judges chapter 3, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Judges chapter 3 and verse 10. This has to do with the judges that judged Israel. And here, um, the nation of Israel was brought into bondage. And uh, verse 9, they cried unto the Lord, and God gave them um, Caleb's younger brother, Oth uh, Othniel, uh, the son of Kenes. And look at verse 10. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. Uh, so the Spirit of God didn't dwell in anyone. He came upon them. Uh, look again at 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. And see this again. This is a very important thing when we talk about uh, this uh, mystery of the indwelling. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. And look at verse number 10. This is uh, the anointing of uh, Saul as their king, and Samuel's doing the work. Verse 9, it says, and, so, and it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came uh, thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him. All right? So again, <clears throat> they didn't have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God just came upon them. And we'll look at one more. I just want, want you to see it's not an isolated case. Uh, First uh, Chronicles, just keep going to the right. First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, First Chronicles 12. First Chronicles chapter 12. We'll look at verse 18. Uh, David's uh, men, um, they uh, ran to him after he ran from Saul. And um, David had some choice men with him, uh, found in the previous chapter. <coughs> um, and uh, it's uh, amazing when you look at the list of the names of the people that had joined themselves. It's called David's Mighty Men. And one of those uh, is found in verse 18 of our chapter 12, uh, Amasa. Then the Spirit came upon Amasa, who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thine helpers. For thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the band. So here it is again. The Spirit came upon Amasa. Uh, so all through the Old Testament, 
Um, like with Samson, that's a familiar one that we're, you know, we know the, the Sunday school lesson too, is that uh, the Spirit of God came upon him and he would have power to do certain things. And, uh, and then the Spirit of God would lead him. Uh, if you remember, um, I didn't use this one, but it would probably have been a good one to do it. Remember after he slept on Delilah's legs, knees, finally told her the secret, she cut his hair, and it said he rose up as he did at other times, and wist not, that's an old English word, didn't know, knew not, wist not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. So there it came upon him and it leaves. And so, um, this is a, an interesting thing. In the Old Testament, God's Spirit only visited select individuals and resided only temporarily on those he empowered. It was a, a temporary thing. This empowerment, whether it was wisdom or it was power or it was direction, always manifested itself in a supernatural way. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and um, there's a reason for this, and Paul tells the, the Corinthians why uh, the manifestation of this, the Spirit of God was also su always supernatural. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. In the Old Testament, who's the primary audience in the Old Testament? Jews. Jews, okay. And so the empowerment of the Spirit of God would come upon people, and it would always be in a supernatural way so that people could observe it. And the reason is, is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, for the Jews require what? Signs. They sign. require a sign. So it had to be a supernatural experience, and uh, they require a sign. And the difference between the Jews and the Greeks is the Greeks seek after wisdom, according to this verse, the Jews require a sign. You remember when Moses came down to the children of Israel and um, uh, they said, well, how do we know that, that God sent you? And God had already instructed him what to do. What did he tell him to do? Throw your staff down on the ground. Turned into a snake. All right. Then he picked it back up. Tested his faith. All right. And then what was the next thing he did? He put his hand inside his robe, pulled it out. It was leprous. Put it back in. And it was so the Jews require a sign. Um, it, it, all the way through the Bible, you will see this. They continually ask the sign. You remember when we were talking last week, uh, Matthew chapter 24, and uh, the disciples asked Jesus as they walked out of Jerusalem, and uh, the, the disciples were talking about all the wonderful buildings in Jerusalem, and uh, they asked him three questions. All right. When are you coming back? Okay. What are the signs? Signs. Mm -hmm. And when will the end be? The Jews always require a sign. This is what's messed up the Christian church. The Christian church, because they don't divide the Word of God correctly, they don't understand the Bible correctly, they're always trying to get what God gave to the Jews. And so they have to talk in tongues, they have to do miracles, they have to do... None of those things were for a Gentile group. That was always to convince an unbelieving Jew that the supernatural work was of God. Remember Nicodemus' question to Jesus in John chapter 3? Master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Why? How? No man could do the miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. That's what, that's what Nicodemus was convinced that Jesus was from God because he did miracles. That's just what Jews, that's how they operate. I mean, you know, prove it. And so God would prove that to them. And so the empowerment in the Old Testament always manifested itself in a supernatural way. Samson could have just been able to pick up heavy boulders, but instead he pulls gates and columns clear up out of the ground. All right? There's so many different uh, pictures there of that, that it's a supernatural uh, thing. So it was to convince the Old Testament Jew that the thing was of God. 
This is expressly why the wording in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is why it is. Look at Acts chapter 1. And look at verse 8. Remember the question, verse 6. Remember the people that were there, verse 4. All Jews, okay, will you restore the kingdom? It's not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive, here it is, the demonstration, power. This is the sign. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And the power happens in chapter 2. You know that it was something. Look at verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not these all these which speak Galileans? Supernatural. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Supernatural. God always deals with the Jews supernatural. You couldn't find a Gentile in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 if you looked all night with a flashlight. It's not there. <laughs> okay? It's not there. They're all Jews. If you look at the the, they, you, and you trace it back, it's always Jews. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. All right. So, um, the wording is so important in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It's also why Peter said to an Old Testament thinking Jewish audience in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16 alright but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel Old Testament alright, notice verse 17 and it shall come to pass in the last days saith God I will pour out my spirit upon all of you. All right, there it is, the supernatural experience with supernatural signs to follow. Look at verse number uh, uh, 18. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon to blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. All of those are supernatural signs. Who's that for? Jews. First Jews. Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. It's for the Jews. Jews. All right. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we can't find instruction and, and uh, edification in those verses. But as we began our study so many years ago, Rita, you probably were the only one here of the group during that time, is who the letter is addressed to is of utmost importance. Mm -hmm. All right. Just because you might find something within the letter that you can identify with, you know, say say someone wrote a letter to, what's your name today? Let's say someone wrote a letter to Bob, and then it says, I notice that you have a heavy beard, and I have a heavy beard, so I find association with that. There's no question if I look at the letter that the heavy beard wasn't about me. Even though I find association with it, the heavy beard was about him. You follow what I'm saying? Is that I can find many associations. You might say 5'11". Well, we're both about the same height. Say 140 pounds. We're both about the same weight. And uh, what size shoe do you wear? Three. Now, we both wear the same size shoe. So there's a lot of similarities. I might make a lot of connection with that letter, but who's the letter addressed to? Bob. <laughs> okay, so so the, the same is true with God's Word, all right? And God's Word is, is that it's very important for us to look at who it's written to. And when we come to the Word of God, what's the only three people or three classes that it can be written to? Jews, Gentiles, Church of God. There isn't a third or fourth. It's one of those three. And that's the reason that it's so important. Look with me just so you can see this again. I know we've done it, but I just want you to see it. James chapter 1. James chapter 1.
James chapter 1, and look at verse number 1. James chapter 1, and verse number 1. What's the Bible say? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to who? Twelve tribes. Twelve tribes. Who's that? Israel. That's Israel, okay, which are scattered abroad, greeting. So it's important when we look at the letter, I might find a lot of things in the letter that I really find identification with, but I should never lose sight of who it is written directly to. And the reason that this is important is because I'm going to just write right over here. Somehow or another, I'm going to write remember to have to stay in between the lines, is that there is a doctrinal there is a um, historical and there is a spiritual application of the Bible. So when I look at James, historically, I know when it was written. James actually penned the words. It has historical application. It has a doctrinal application, and it identifies who the doctrine is in verse 1, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. It has a Jewish doctrinal reference. And then a spiritual application. I can apply those, even though I'm not one of the 12 tribes scattered abroad. I may find uh, that there are many things in the book that I can find identification with. For instance, look at verse number 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's one of the Proverbs in the Bible found in James that... You and I do well to make sure that we're not following someone that's double-minded. Why? Because it's an unstable soul. Someone that's double-minded. You know what a double-minded is? They do one thing one day and one thing the next day. You never know for sure what they're going to do. They're unstable. So I can find identification in the book even from a spiritual standpoint. All right. Um, and let me show you another. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. So there's another, another thing I can find great identification with um, in, in reading the Word of God, okay? Um, and look at verse uh, number 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. There, I can find identification in those things. However, all right, look at James chapter 2, verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? That verse I cannot find identification with. Because Paul wrote, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you say through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, listen, not of works, lest any man should perish. Alright? Or both, excuse me. So, so, James is writing to a Jewish audience, doctrinally, and he says, faith without works is dead. Who does he cite for that? Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? Alright. Now, just so that you understand the difference, look at Romans. Hold your hand there, James. Romans chapter 4. First, let 
Who is Romans addressed to? Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's that written to? The church. church, church. All right. The church. All right. Now look at chapter 4. Which Who's James written to? Twelve tribes scattered abroad, right? Uh, which James, uh, Romans chapter 4 say? What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, uh-oh, James said he was. If Abraham were justified by works, he hath swear of the glory, but not before God. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, Genesis uh, chapter uh, 12, verse 6 or something like that, or verse 5. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, it is, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So two opposing thoughts, one presented in James, one presented in Romans. Romans to the church, it says, in agreement with Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's all about faith. And it doesn't have anything to do with works. But to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, it's saying, you can believe all you want, but if you don't prove it. All right. Now, Romans chapter 4 has to do with salvation by grace through faith. All right. James chapter 3 has to do with a Jew being accepted by God. That's a big difference. So when we look at Scripture, one of the very important things to do is see who's the letter written to. Who is the letter written to? I'll give you one more, just real quick. Deuteronomy 6. Does anybody have at the top of their page of their Bible a reference that kind of summarizes what Deuteronomy 6 is about? At the very top, do you have any references up there? Just like a headline or a Deuteronomy 6. At the very top. Mine says fear in God's presence. So. Oh, okay. The command to love the Lord. The command to love the Lord. Command to love the Lord. Would you say yours was? Uh, fear in God's presence. Okay, anybody else have anything? Israel to keep God's commandments. Say that one more time. Israel to keep God's commandments. Okay. So who was the first name? Israel. 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 <laughs> okay, so uh, it's interesting. Uh, we could find that by looking at Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, who's identified, who's the letter to in verse 4? Israel. Israel. Hear, O Israel. <laughs> Can't get much clearer than that. This, this letter is to Israel. All right. Deuteronomy 6, and look at verse 25. To Israel. And what does it say? For by grace are you saved through faith. Is that what it says? Righteousness. Righteousness comes how? According to verse 25. To the pure, O Israel. If we observe to do all the commandments. Works. <laughs> you have to keep the commandments. Now, I'm just jumping from one text to another, but this is consistent all the way through the Bible. All the way through the Bible. The Jew always connects something they do personally to an acceptance of God, not as an individual, but as a nation. They always connect works. Something they do the Jews. Alright? And so this is so important that 
the reason their supernatural works are assigned to um, manifestations of the Spirit of God coming upon people in the Old Testament is so that an unbelieving Jew would see what Nicodemus said. We know that thou art a teacher come from God because no man could do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. They, they knew that. And, I mean, you think about Moses. He comes down. Imagine if he didn't have the staff and he didn't have the hand of leprosy. And let's imagine that the nation of Israel just said, okay, we believe you because we're tired of this place. And Moses walks into Pharaoh. You remember what Pharaoh did? When the first time Moses said, let my people go? Pharaoh says, your people have too much idle time. We're going to take away the straw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think the nation of Israel would have done with him? <laughs> they, would have, they would have thrown him out of his ear. All right. But the staff and the hand and the, the nation of Israel says, we were better off before you came here. But we cannot deny that no man could do the miracles that thou dost except God be with him. That, that's how they identify. They identify with signs and wonders. Now, the last recorded time God's Spirit came upon someone in the New Testament was Acts chapter 12. Look with me there. Acts chapter 12. And this is a very important thing. Again, let me just say to you that Acts, the book of Acts, is what we call a transitional book. A transitional book. Who's the Old Testament primary uh, people? Jews. The New Testament, past the Gospels, who's the primary focus? Gentiles. Yes. The church and Gentiles. And so Acts becomes this transition. Come out like that. Transition between those two factors. Because uh, God was dealing with the Jews. And he turns his heart to the Gentiles and the church. I want you to see this real quick before we get to Acts. Hold your hand there in Acts and look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. We'll come back to Acts. And then we'll have to stop today. Acts chapter 2. Paul, if you remember the, the in Galatians here... Paul had gotten saved and went to the backside of the desert, got educated by the Spirit of God, said, God revealed this to me. It's my gospel. And then he goes up to Jerusalem, which is Acts 16. That's important. Acts 16. If you look at Acts chapter 1, chapter 28, it is scope and sequence. It goes like this. It doesn't go like um, First and Second Kings, First Second Chronicles, where you're jumping back and forth all the time. Acts is this is the beginning, and this is the end, and you have this trajectory straight through. So Acts chapter 16 is where Paul goes up to the church, made mostly up of apostles, Jews, and he talks about what God's done for him that he has instructed him in the ways of the Lord and that he had sent him out as a chosen vessel to the Gentiles to make known what is the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And there was some argument. Do you remember in Acts 16, there was some argument. There were some that believed that you had to keep the commandments. Some believed that you uh, believe in Jesus and keep the commandments. And Peter, all right, which is Acts chapter 10, says, you know what? I had three guys knock at my door and ask me to go see a guy whose name was Cornelius, mm -hmm. who was a Gentile. 
And if I hadn't seen that sheet come down from heaven three different times, and that was significant, if I hadn't seen that sheep come down from heaven three different times and ask me to eat, kill and eat food that was unclean for a Jew to eat, I would have never got it through my thick head. But you had three up, three visitors, three sheets, and I was all of a sudden listening really clear, and God said to go over there to Cornelius. And, um, and in chapter 10, because I know that 10 is a number of the Gentiles, and uh, so I go, I, I go over... In chapter 10, I go over to Cornelius, and I was getting ready to preach Acts 2, verse 38 to him. Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And right in the middle of the message, God interrupted me, and the Spirit of God fell on Cor Cornelius. I didn't even get to say amen at the end. <laughs> he, he interrupted my sermon before I was finished. And he said, I made a perception from that that God's not a respecter of persons. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 16, the argument takes place. Peter stands up and says, hey, huh, I've already been through this. And as a result of that, God sends Paul one direction and Peter a different direction. Which direction? Galatians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, who's that? The uncircumcision. Gentiles, okay was committed unto me. <clears throat> Who's the writer of Galatians? Paul. <clears throat> okay. Um, as the gospel of the circumcision. Who's that? Jews. Yeah. Was to Peter. Transition. What was Peter? He was a Jew. And Paul says, God chose me to preach his name among the Gentiles. And so we have in the book of Acts this transition, and it took 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 chapters to get through that God was doing something different. And all of the first 10 chapters are all about Jews. Until we get to chapter 10, and all of a sudden pops up this Cornelius, a Gentile. All right. Now, <clears throat> look at chapter 12, which is just before chapter 16. And notice in verse number 7, the last time in the Bible that the Spirit of God came upon someone. Acts chapter 12 and verse 7. And behold, the angel of the Lord... Came upon. Last time you'll find it in the New Testament, or in the Bible, where the Spirit of God came upon someone. Now you say, we've talked about everything, I can't even remember why we're doing it. Because we're talking about this mystery in Colossians 1.27, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Never had happened before. Never had Christ in us, upon us, for power, for wisdom, Remember all those that were uh, took care of creating the tabernacle? The spirit of wisdom came upon them. The spirit of creativity came upon them. God did that. All right. But it left. Came, left, came, left. Whenever there was a need, and it always came in a supernatural way, so you didn't have to wonder if it happened. Okay? It was obvious. The last time in the New Testament the Spirit of God came upon someone was just before Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, guess who you see after Acts chapter 16 in the rest of the book of Acts and the absence of someone? The absence of who after Acts 16? Peter. The presence of who after Acts 16? Paul. Transition. Transitioning from the Jew the Gentile in the church. And it is so clear when you look at it and see it in the scriptures. Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You look in there, you will not find, with an exception of Cornelius and the Ethiopian eunuch, you will not find a Gentile among them. They're all Jews. And even, even the Ethiopian eunuch, why was he going down, why was he coming back from Jerusalem? Remember we studied that? Horsham. He, he converted, proselyted. He was converted to Judaism. So, 
Cornelius becomes the first Gentile. Gentile. Mm -hmm. All right. And so Acts is a transition book. And that's the reason. Now, if you're messed up in your theology, guess where you're going to spend all your time in the book of Acts? In the first 12 chapters. The first 12 chapters. And what are you going to get? Tongues, healing, miracles, wonders. No. All of them are going to be there. Why? Mm -hmm. Colossians, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, the Jews require a sign. And that's, when you go through the book of Acts, what you find at the tail end is not what you find at the beginning. It was Acts 16, verse 11, excuse me, Acts 15, verse 11, <clears throat> that Peter says, we believe through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. <clears throat> First time in the Bible, you find grace connected with the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And not deliverance saved, but personal relationship saved. Remember who, what Peter said when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Peter said, oh, they say this, that, Jesus, but, but who, who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that Peter got something. And he was the minister to the circumcision, the Jew, and that's the reason in the book of Acts, he just drifts out of the picture. As God turns his attention from the Jew, just like we said, he came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, he begins to move towards the Gentiles. And that's the reason the book of Acts is such a very, very pivotal and important book. By Acts 16, it is all Paul. And Peter is like, I was going to like to say dust, but <laughs> dust is everywhere. So I said Peter is like the uh, proverbial needle in the haystack, okay, from Acts 16. On. All right, so one of the things that we've been looking at is this mystery of Colossians 1 27. Why is it called a mystery? And that is because the Spirit of God coming upon people ended in the New Testament. No Old Testament Jew had any expectations or desired a personal indwelling of God's Spirit. Their relationship was national, not personal. That is so important. The Jew never, ever talked about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or with God. It was always national. And uh, so we'll stop there and we'll pick it up next week. Uh, Lord willing, right there. Sound good? All right. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. And thank you for visiting us online. We welcome you to join us in about 20 minutes for our morning worship service. We've got a special guest speaker today. And that will be uh, good. Uh, Larry is going to be speaking today. He's one of our ministerial students who's uh, serving uh, as an intern for his Masters of Divinity. And he will be speaking today. We have kids that are returned from camp that are going to testify. It'll be a great service. We hope that you'll join us. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your goodness as always to us, for your word that always comes alive. And pray, Father, that it would uh, uh, stir our hearts to know you and learn about you and want to know you more. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Spirit of God that dwells in us, the hope of glory. And we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll uh, see you in about 20 minutes. <laughs>